If you're considering buying a resale property in DC, there's a crucial document you'll need to review for every property that you're interested in pursuing. This is known as the property disclosure statement or for short, the PDS. And I see time and time again that people either don't fully understand what this document means or its legal ramifications, as well as the fact that it's not properly filled out. And that's why in this video, I'm gonna give you the complete rundown on how to go about this, whether you're a buyer or a seller. So getting right into it, as a buyer, this document is vital because it could significantly influence your decision on whether or not to proceed with an offer on a property. The PDS is designed to protect both sellers and buyers by ensuring all known issues with the property are disclosed up front and not hidden. The PDS comes in various forms depending on the type of property, such as single family homes, strata properties, or rural properties. It's important to note that these forms are frequently updated to reflect the latest legal requirements and standards, so always ensure you're working with the most current version. Because unfortunately, I feel like they update them every three to six months. For sellers, the PDS is arguably the most important document to complete accurately to avoid potential lawsuits in the future. Misrepresentation or failure to disclose known issues could lead to legal action and eventually an expensive lawsuit. Buyers, on the other hand, should review the PDS carefully to understand any disclosed issues that could affect the property's value or their desire to purchase it. There are a variety of different things that can be disclosed in this document, which we'll get to in a minute, such as the age of the roof, if there's been any previous special assessments in a strata property, and if there's any material latent defects, which we'll explain in a minute. The form itself is honestly pretty straightforward, consisting of a series of questions that the seller must answer to the best of their abilities, indicating yes, no, I don't know, or does not apply. However, not all questions give you all four options. Sellers must initial the responses to ensure accuracy and accountability and can't just be checked off. It's crucial for sellers to understand that any work done on the property without necessary permits or any known defects that are not necessarily easily observable must be disclosed in the PDS. Failure to do so can lead to significant legal and financial repercussions, so it's always best to just disclose everything up front. And with that, now let's take a look and go over the PDS itself. So here we have the actual property disclosure statement. The one I'm gonna be going over in this video is the strata title properties as mentioned. There is also one for single family detached homes as well as rural, but we deal with these a lot, especially here in the lower mainland. So I thought I would go over this one. Additionally, there's actually a bare land strata. So these are non bare land. So your typical condos or townhomes and some other properties as well. But let's get right into it. So the first page is not actually part of the disclosure statement. It does not form part of the disclosure statement, but it is just for informational purposes only. So similar to the contract of purchase and sale, it just has some additional information, but does not actually form part of this statement. I do see occasionally that some realtors will have their clients initial off on it. I don't. It's not mandatory, but I think that's just to show that they've actually read it. Moving on to our first page, what you're gonna see is, so the date of the disclosure, and so this is actually supposed to be within 30 days of the purchase. Ideally, that's what we like to see and it should actually be filled out before the listing goes live and it sits in a spot online typically that only realtors have access to there is a document section on the back end of our mls platform that we can access and provide to you or occasionally sometimes the listing realtor will not provide it until it has been requested now we also run into the situation sometimes where they won't actually provide a pds until there is an accepted offer. You don't run into this very often, but there are some who do choose to do that. Now, moving on, you would have the unit number here, pretty straightforward, and then what the property contains. So principal residence, residences, barn sheds. So generally, you're just gonna see principal residence checked off, and if you have to explain it, then you will put additional information in here. So the seller is going to get this form, and technically, they're actually supposed to fill it out completely on their own. Now, this doesn't generally happen. I'm technically supposed to hand it to them and say, fill it out yourself and then take it back from them afterwards. But generally, I'm gonna be working through it with them, not providing them with answers, but just trying to help them understand it so that they can answer it to the best of their abilities. So 
some of the first questions regarding land, as you'll see here, if there are two sellers on title, they both have to get their initials into the box where they're answering the question. Hopefully they're answering the same answer as each other. However, technically they could answer differently. I've never seen it, but hypothetically it could happen. Now, what you're gonna to wanna to note here is that anything that is dark gray, you do not have the ability to answer here. You have to answer where it is white. So again, it's to the best of your ability as a seller. So are you aware of any past or present underground oil storage tanks in or on the development? So are you aware, right? To the best of your ability. If you're not aware, then it's no. No would mean you either don't know or you know that it's not there. But I digress. Are you aware of any existing tenancies written or oral? Are you aware of any current or pending local improvement levies or charges? Are you aware of any pending litigation or claim affecting the development or unit from any person or public body? As a buyer, this is something that you would want to pay attention to because if there is any ongoing or pending litigation, you wanna know what that is. This could range from somebody having a slip and a fall, which may not be as big of an issue versus I've seen some stratas that they're actually suing contractors or builders for doing poor or unfinished work. And those can be major, major issues. So something that if it is mentioned, and even if it's not mentioned, you wanna do your due diligence on. Now I'm not gonna go through every single thing here. Not every single aspect of this needs to be signed. For instance, please indicate the water systems the development uses. So if it is water right from your local government and it's not on septic or sewer, then you're just going to check off right here and you won't have to actually do any of the other ones. But for instance here, if you indicated to A that the development has a private groundwater or private surface, right? So if you click this one, then you're gonna have to answer some further questions. But for the most part, especially in my market, you're just going to be able to check this one off. Now at the bottom of every page, they're going to have spaces, again, similar to the contract of purchase and sale, that both the buyers and the sellers need to initial off on and they need to initial on every single page. Now, conveniently, they've actually added additional boxes in the past couple of years because we're seeing more and more that there are additional buyers which then become sellers on the title of all properties because of the fact that it's just becoming harder and harder to afford. So they're taking more individuals to qualify for a higher mortgage in order to do so. But anyways, as we move on to page two, again, this is gonna autofill the data disclosure. The address is also going to autofill so you don't have to worry too much about that. It will move on to building, respecting the unit and common property. So has a final building inspection been approved or a final occupancy permit been obtained? Has a fireplace, fireplace insert or wood stove insulation been approved? So this is wet. So generally this is for an actual wood burning fireplace. So I've yet to come across this. They could be out there or say more so in older detached properties, less so in strata properties. However, I have ran across the occasional wood burning fireplace in a condo. Although the one that I did see most recently was closed off, so it wasn't applicable. Is the unit occupied or has the unit been previously occupied? Are you the owner developer? Does the unit have any equipment leases or service contracts? So I'm not gonna go through every single aspect here, but most of it is pretty straightforward. You just need to answer as honestly as possible. And then once again, initials down in the corners. Now, if there has been any special assessments voted or proposed, you need to answer this honestly. And most of the time, what you'll also wanna be doing is filling in down below any additional information that is applicable to that. So for instance, I just had a listing that had a small special levy that was approved for a couple months in the future for close to $600. So. The sellers initialed off here that yes, they do have something upcoming and then we put 3Q down in the additional comment section and mentioned the amount and what it was for and just being very clear to any potential buyers what it is, how much it is and what it's gonna be doing. And then have you paid any special assessments in the past five years? So anything in the past, again, you would do the same here and it's always best to just mention what it is going towards and how much the amount of that special levy was. And then a few more questions. Sometimes people get confused around a few of these because it's just not common. For instance, is there a current enter guide for houses? Rating number available for this unit? Don't see this a ton. There are some for some of the newer homes, but most of the time people are gonna put, I don't know or no. But again, just answer to the best of your ability. 
Then nature of interest or ownership. So of course, is it freehold? Is it leasehold, timeshare, cooperative, undivided? So most of the time it's gonna be either freehold or leasehold. There are some cooperatives. I've yet to see undivided or timeshare. However, this could happen as well. And then you're gonna be putting in the strata management company, name of the manager themselves, as well as the address that they operate out of and the telephone. And then if it's self-managed, you do the same thing. Moving on, we would have the initial down here once again for buyers and sellers again day will be auto populated the address will be auto populated and for this portion of the form what you're typically gonna see is that this will be crossed out and it will say request from realtor or realtor has copies and so you won't see exactly what is or isn't included right here but the realtor if they have done things properly will have ordered the strata documents hopefully before they've listed the property or very very close to if it's within in a few days that's typically fine however prior to is always best so you can actually provide it to the buyers and they can do the due diligence and sometimes even remove their subject to reviewing strata documents but i digress mentioning what the strata fee is and then here you actually will be filling it out and unfortunately it can be very difficult if you have two people and especially three people when you're making initials down here so this is talking about number one how much is the strata fee and then what is included in the strata fee so it's important to know this and to provide this information as honestly and accurately as possible of course you can always reach out to your strata manager if you're a little bit confused i don't always suggest looking at previous listings i know a lot of people will do this however it's insane the amount of realtors who do not put the correct information on the mls so if you're looking on whether it's realtor.ca or on the back end of paragon which is what we use it's not always super accurate but once again i digress now moving on number of parking stalls included and what types of parking stalls are they? So limited common property, common property, rented, long-term lease, other. Generally, it's gonna be limited common property. Sometimes it's common property. I'm not gonna go through the details of what exactly these mean right now. But something to note is that if you have a driveway on a townhome, for instance, these are not considered parking stalls technically, right? Like, yes, they can be used for parking, but it's not specifically assigned to you. The same as a garage as well, because they would have specific numbers typically we're looking at this for condos for instance you have a two bed condo you have two parking spots and they're going to be number 57 and 58 which can be confirmed on the form b however what i do often see is that people will include the number of parking stalls as driveway or garage where technically they're not actually parking stalls they are parking spaces but they're not parking stalls that are specifically assigned to the unit now does it have a storage locker so again more applicable to condos however sometimes a townhome will have it and then what is the number once again is it limited common property is it common property is it rented important things to know and then of course the buyers and sellers initials and then moving on this is where a lot of people I find will get confused sometimes even myself until I was recently educated on it because it was something that was recently added into the property disclosure statement and that is questions about radon and so essentially radon is a naturally occurring radioactive odorless and colorless gas that is generated through the decay of uranium and other elements in soil minerals as radon seeps up through the ground it can find its way into your home through cracks in your property foundation and walls and because new homes are built to be energy efficient and are sealed from the outside radon can build up in your home over time to dangerous levels now I have never run into any issues with this but a lot of my clients see this are unsure concerned and of course we can always do our due diligence on it, but in every experience I've had, there has never been any issues with this, but I'm not the expert in radon myself, so I'm not going to touch too much more on that. Now moving on, general, so are you aware if the unit or any other unit or the development has been used to grow cannabis? This is a big one because if it was a grow off at a certain point in time or there has been previous owners that were using it as a drug lab or anything else, it can make it very difficult for future purchasers or you as a purchaser to get financing on it. So the biggest one here in BC is generally a grow up and what it'll typically say is it's a remediated grow up. Now, 
This is an issue that they still need to fix. They're still working through. Again, not gonna get into too much details here, but when we run into that issue, typically there's only very, very select few lenders that will lend on the property. And most of the time they're gonna require a minimum of 20% down, if not more, and it can make it very difficult for resale. So it's something that you need to be made aware of. And of course, you can't tell by visible inspection most of the time that it was a grow up. So the seller needs to disclose it as this is what we would consider a material latent defect. So as I mentioned, the next one, are you aware of any latent defect in respect to the development? For the purposes of this question, latent defect means a defect that cannot be discerned through a reasonable inspection of the development that renders the development dangerous or potentially dangerous to occupants or unfit for habitation. So another thing potentially would be mold if it's hidden behind the walls and you're aware of it or anything else that could be dangerous and again, can't be seen upon a reasonable inspection. Now, if you're able to pop your head into the attic to find a leak or something of that nature, again, it should be disclosed, but there could be some discretion there. I'm not a lawyer, so speak to your lawyer about a situation such as that. But once again, if it's something that you're aware of, just disclose, disclose, disclose. It's not worth getting into a legal battle and legal troubles and financial issues down the road because you're trying to hide something. But another thing to mention here, and it's not necessarily for the strata properties, but if there is an unauthorized suite or a legal suite, now I'm not gonna get into the differences between them all, but if you're in a place like Surrey, Langley, Maple Ridge, you're gonna see probably about 80% of the suites or so are unauthorized. So again, not gonna touch on that too much, but that is actually a material latent defect and does need to be disclosed to all potential buyers. Now, as I mentioned before, of course, we don't wanna miss out on the initials at the bottom of the page. The additional comment, so if you're explaining anything as part of the contract, so if you were saying 4A was used to grow cannabis or manufacture illegal substances, maybe you wanna disclose what exactly it was. Maybe it was a meth lab, so you're going 4A previous meth lab. Haven't seen that one yet. But again, just trying to give you an example, this is where you would make those statements. Now, at this point in time, this is also where you will be signing as a seller. So the written name will go here and then the sign name will go above. And so this is where I actually see a lot of issues from the seller and realistically the seller's agent because they're the ones that are dating this. And that's right here, which says, the buyer acknowledges that the buyer has received, read and understood a signed copy of the property disclosure statement from the seller or the seller's broker on this given date. So that means the date that the buyer has gotten it. If the seller has already put a date in here and that is prior to when the buyer receives it, this is wrong. So again, I see this from time to time, but just make sure that this is the date you're receiving it not the date that they're filling it out. And then the buyer is going to sign below. So they're going to actually have their signature here. And as I mentioned, their written name, just so you can actually read it, it's all gonna be done electronically, or at least most of the time these days, there are some people that choose to still do it by hand and there's not an issue there. A lot of times if it's the seller, sometimes they will do this form by hand, just because it's easier, they can have it and then scan it and send it off afterwards. But all the following signatures are typically done electronically. Personally, Personally, what I do is I will send it off to them, ask them to print it out, not necessarily sign off the first time, but maybe check off all the boxes. Then I will send it back to them for the electronic signatures for the initials so that it looks nice and clean and is easy to read and comprehend and just keep it as a digital file to make everybody's life easier. But that's about it. Hopefully that all made sense. But if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Now, just one more point that I wanted to mention is that if the property is tenanted, vacant, or it's a seller who doesn't own or live in the property, typically what they're gonna do is cross out the entire property disclosure statement on each page. And essentially what they're doing is making no disclosure about the property because they do not reside on the residence. So if you do see it crossed out, I would just confirm that it is tenanted or is an estate sale or power of attorney or something along those lines. However, if it is an owner and they refuse to answer the property disclosure statement or they choose to cross it out and they are residing in the property itself, 
that would be a bit of a red flag to me. Because to me, that's stating that they're trying to hide something. But that's just my two cents. You'll have to make up your own mind when it comes down to it. So there you have it. There is my overview of the property disclosure statement. I know it's not a very exciting video. If you're a client of mine, I apologize, but we have to get it done. And if you're just somebody who is trying to educate themselves, hopefully you learned something today. And on that note, after watching this video, if you are considering buying or selling, in Surrey, Langley, or the rest of the Fraser Valley, or you just want to chat about real estate, you can scroll down and hit the first link in the description to book a call with me at a time that works best for you. If you are interested in seeing more videos just like this one and educating yourself on the BC and Canadian real estate market, as well as seeing community tours across the lower mainland, I suggest you consider subscribing to our channel. As always, if you do have any questions or comments, leave them down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you check out another video on our channel and we'll We'll see you in the next one.